Welcome, welcome to the Spring 2014 Speech Night. My name is Professor Todd Guy and I am the director of the speech and debate team here at Modesto Junior College. To begin with, for those of you who are standing near the exit doors, don't be shy, find the seat. Find the seat. We still have some empty seats, I see. For those of you who have empty seats next to you, you might kind of move in and get closer to the people around you. Because no matter what, you're going to have someone sitting next to you soon. There's lots of people out there in the lobby, so I'm just stalling for a little bit. But they should have gotten here on time. Dark. Get here on time. As my students know. Because if not, then I go, I gotta make money. So, the first thing that I'll tell you about this evening is that the speech and debate team here on campus is a team that is actually the very first competitive team on campus. Back in the 1920s, when Modesto Junior College was first beginning, they originated by having a debate team. One of the other amazing things about speech and debate is unlike a lot of the other sports teams or competitive teams on campus, we actually compete against the two-year community colleges, of course, but also the four-year universities. So we're competing against UC Berkeley and San Francisco State and Stanford and UC Davis and San Jose State. We have to compete against those as well. So the students that you're going to be seeing doing present presentations today are students who have all qualified for our state championship, which will be happening in a couple of weeks. And so at this stage of the game, they're certainly considered some of the best speakers and debaters and interpreters in all of Northern California. Because we could not get all of them to perform as well, some of them will be introducing some of the slots as well, just so that you really get an opportunity to hear from and see all of the individuals who will be going to the state championship. But then you'll also be seeing individuals who competed on the team throughout the year as well. Anyone at Modesto Junior College can come out for the speech and debate team to help improve your communication skills. And certainly, as a competitive team, what we're working towards as a final goal is to find people who can then qualify for the state championships, and then even those individuals who can qualify for a national championship as well. So we are fortunate on campus to be a competitive team that also gets to compete on a national level as well, which unfortunately some of our sports teams don't have the opportunity to do. The other important thing to then realize about that national team is that here at Modesto Junior College, you actually have had and have national award-winning speakers and debaters. Over the history of my coaching career, the past seven years, three of those seven years, we've come home from nationals with the national champion in parliamentary debate out of the entire nation. And this evening, you will be introduced to two very special young ladies who last year came in second place in the entire nation with a silver medal award. And so we'll be going back to nationals this year trying to bring home the gold. And you'll meet them a little bit later in the whole program. Now certainly over the years, it has been a responsibility that has been on my shoulders to be the official head coach of the speech and debate team on campus. But certainly the success also came from all of my colleagues in the speech department. 
sending me the talent that is probably even sitting out there right now watching speech night. Some of your instructors will be saying, you know, you should go talk to Todd Guy because you have a good sense of you being in front of an audience. You possibly could be the next national champion. But this year, fortunately, uh, I am very thrilled to also be able to have another full-time speech professor who is assisting me with this team and helping all of the students you will see tonight reach that state award-winning and national award-winning level. And I'd like to bring him out right now, so please give a round of applause to Professor Daniel Lopez. Good evening, everyone. I would like to further extend Todd's thanks for coming out tonight and supporting the team. I can't begin to tell you how much we all appreciate it. From the coaches who devote hours and hours to the students to assist them to compete, to the students who spend those hours and hours practicing in order to maintain that competitive level. As Todd mentioned to you earlier, uh, forensics is a fierce competition and Modesto Junior College has done its best over the years to maintain excellence in that competition. But I would also like all of you to note that while forensics and standing up on this stage might seem like an extremely lofty goal, that there are everyday instances of oratory in your lives, that every day you have experiences and instances that are moving all around you, and that the ability to speak up and be heard over these issues is an invaluable skill. And gaining that power is something that we seek to offer our students. The ability to identify how the world is moving around them, how it affects them, and how they can effectively interact with that world in order to affect change. And I think the most valuable skill you learn, whether it be in a communications class or through an activity such as forensics, is to channel that power. For as I tell every student who passes through my class, someone will inevitably speak for you if you do not speak for yourself. And you might not always like what that person has to say. This is a wonderful opportunity to see how this skill can be accomplished at the highest levels and to start thinking about how it's a skill that you can use in your life on an everyday basis. So I hope you'll have a good time tonight despite the uh, seemingly serious message. <laughs> and that you will enjoy what our speakers have worked so hard to offer you tonight. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the 2014 Modesto Junior College Forensics Team. <laughs> Starting with Melinda Dawson, Emily Akers, Carissa Autry, James Ball, Lauren Carvajal, Rachel Carr, Kelly Gay Searley, Mikey Gonzalez, Jacob Bowman, Nicole Klinker, who's actually <laughs> Tiny. Uh, Tyrus Loveless, Shannon McCall, Shannon Montgomery, Jamal Anagi, Michael Rorick. John Salmon, Josiah Shelton, Lisa Seaborn, Ronald Thompson, and Kelsey Walter. I'd also like to take one final moment as the students are clearing the stage to recognize Rob over here. Some of you, if you're on the track team, might be familiar with Rob. He's been coaching for a long time. He's also a volunteer here with the program. He stops by every Tuesday and Thursday, and he's been actively coaching the students. So a round of applause for Rob and all his time. And now the joyous moment you have all been waiting for. We will begin the introductions for the events. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is Josiah Scolton and I'm 
a participant in the forensic debate team at Madison Junior College. Uh, I've won awards in extemporaneous speaking, impromptu speaking, and parliamentary debate. I'll be proudly representing MDC at this year's state national tournament. You can all applaud for me for that if you like. <laughs> Michael Gonzalez, our first speaker, has taken awards in both persuasive and informative speaking, and tonight we'll be presenting his informative speech. An informative speech is simply a speech with cited sources that is designed to introduce the audience to a new idea or concept. This, is, this evening, Mikey will, will be explaining a process which will revolutionize how we receive our medicine. I would ask that you all give a warm round of applause to Mr. Mikey Gonzalez. In 2012, the United Nations Children's Fund estimates that every 20 seconds, a child dies from a curable infectious disease. And according to statistics from the World Health Organization, last accessed February 15, 2014, shows that over 13 million people die from infectious disease each year. 95% of these people live in resource-limited areas. And while many of these diseases could easily be prevented through widespread distribution of currently available vaccines, the issue of how best to formulate, distribute, and administer these vaccines across the world remains a significant unsolved problem. Data from the Global Health Policy Center, last accessed February 15, 2014, estimates that administering vaccines in developing areas is limited by several factors. First off would be the lack of trained personnel. Second is the needle stick injuries resulting from cross-contamination. And finally, you have breakdowns in the refrigeration, also known as the cold chain. Clearly, there is a pressing need for a new vaccine delivery system that is simple, inexpensive, and easy to distribute. And the only way to meet these challenges worldwide is to engineer a better and more efficient way of administering vaccines. And thanks to a recent breakthrough in biotechnology, we now have the NanoPatch. We will first begin by exploring this invention, which actually has the potential to eliminate vaccines of the current method of needle and syringes. Second, we will look at how it works, and finally, we will, list, we will look at the implications it can have worldwide. So in order to understand the nanopatch, we must first understand what it is. Mark Kendall, a biomedical engineer at the University of Queensland, Australia, on January 14, 2014, gave a presentation on TED Talks about his needle-free method of administering vaccines. He designed the nanopatch to deliver vaccines painlessly to the skin. The nanopatch is a one centimeter by one centimeter square of silicon, which is slightly smaller than a dime, and can, is designed to deliver vaccines to the key immune cells, just a hair width below the skin's surface. The central element of this technology are the microprojections, which are microscopic silicon points designed to deliver vaccines to key immune cells. Since no blood is required, it, constantly, it greatly reduces the risk of infection, human error, and contamination from occurring. Another key attribute of the nano patch is that the vaccine is dry and does not require refrigeration. And as a result, it means that costly cold chain would no longer need to be relied upon to prevent temperature damage. According to Mark Kendall, he says the nano patch will be developed with high volume, low cost manufacturing in mind, and will be using well established techniques for cost efficiency. Now that we better understand what the nano patch is, we can compare it to the traditional methods in terms of effectiveness and global usage. In Mark Kendall's research journal, Controlled Release, last updated February 15th, 2014, shows that the nanopatch can greatly enhance the immune response given by a vaccine, which in turn increases its effectiveness. Because vaccines work by stimulating the antiproductions of the antibodies, what it actually allows happening is vaccines can be injected into the muscle tissue by needle syringe for over 170 years. And since modern technology has provided us with a greater understanding of the immune system since then, this process shows that it's completely outdated because it requires a relatively large dose of vaccine per shot to target the necessary immune cells. <coughs> Alternatively, the nano patch is applied using an applicator device, which accurately propels the microprojections into the outer layers of the skin, where immune cells are most numerous. This specific targeting of where immune cells are most numerous makes it a far more abundant in reaching the threshold line of success. And it also shows that the body has responded with a higher level of immunity. Their preclinical experiments have shown the ability of the nanopatch to greatly reduce the amount of vaccine required for effective immunization. 
Second, the main shortcoming of today's vaccinations is the thermal requirements necessary to maintain the cold chain. It requires the king of vaccines to be refrigerated all the way up, all the way till the time of production until when it's administered to the patient. If it's either too warm or too cold, the vaccine will break down. This process can render conventional vaccines ineffective or potentially harmful. According to statistics from the World Health Organization, last updated February 15, 2014, reports that over 50% of vaccines that go to Africa are considered to be defective or not working properly because of a failure in the cold chain. The nanopatch's temperature stability also introduces the option of delivering vaccines to parts of the world where their cold chain infrastructure is unreliable or even non-existent, which can mean the difference between life and death. The nanopatch is also expected to improve vaccine productivity. Since it's a highly adaptable platform technology, it may be suitable for delivering a vast majority of vaccines. According to the Center of Disease Control, last updated February 15, 2015, reports that HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis are responsible for over 7 million deaths per year. And thanks to the potential of the nanopatch to enhance the immune response generated by the vaccine, it makes it far more likely to reach the threshold line of success compared to traditional methods. This will not only allow vaccines to go much further, but also save many more lives. After refining and improving the nanopatch further, Kendall aims to launch clinical trials in Papai New Guinea to vaccinate women against the human papilloma virus, which, is, which can lead to cervical cancer and is the leading cause of death in young women in developing areas around the country. Since the nanopatch is a new medical breakthrough, there are several implications that come along with it, including time, costs, and saving literally millions of lives. While the nanopatch technology is highly adaptable, there are some unavoidable limitations as well. The main drawback of the nanopatch is that even if trials are successful, Kendall states in his presentation that it is likely to take another seven to 10 years before it's introduced on the market. Another problem with the nanopatch is that even though production could drop from a hundredth of the cost, it is not likely that the drug companies will sell this for a hundredth of the price. Despite this, there are still many more beneficial applications specific to this technology. As with any new medical development, cost plays an important role in its success or failure. The potential savings from using less vaccine to achieve an effective immunization, combined with the significant reduction of problems associated with needles, and the elimination of the cold chain, makes the nanopatch exponentially cheaper. The United Nations Children's Fund, last updated February 15, 2014, reports that if refrigeration were not required, the savings from, the, from maintaining the cold chain alone could be sufficient enough to vaccinate a further 10 million more children. And according to ashadlife.org, last updated February 22, 2014, reports that 1.5 million children die from infections every year. And these infections could easily be just, uh, prevented by vaccines. The nanopatch has the potential to drop this number all the way down to zero. And it's extremely plausible to think that in 10 years' time, organizations that provide vaccines to the rest of the world will be able to also establish all, uh, be able to provide all necessary vaccines to developing nations for the same amount of money that they currently spend on vaccination programs that have let 1.5 million children slip through the cracks each year. <coughs> Today, we explored the unique and durable design of the now patch. Second, we looked at how it works. And finally, we looked at the implications it could have worldwide. If one considers all the benefits of the nanopatch, it is quite clear that Mark Kendall's design is a much needed advancement of modern methods. And it represents an unprecedented opportunity of success by making the vaccination process safer, cost-effective, cost and notably more efficient. It is also expected to be an excellent alternative to the needle syringe. But since technology is constantly required to overcome challenges in distributing vaccines to those that need them, especially those in developing areas, we can expect the nanopatch to be an important discovery worldwide that can save millions of lives. Hello, my name is Shannon McCall. I've won awards in dramatic and poetry interpretation. I'll be proudly representing those to Junior College at this year's state tournament. Tyrus Lovelace and John Solomon are your Northern California Novice Champions duo in interpretation. Tonight, they will be performing their award-winning program, a duo interpretation. Of course, it must be, perform must be a performance with two performers who can work with any type of literature. Their main objective is to bring that literature to life without any help from costumes or a stage set. 
Please give a warm round of applause to Mr. Tyrus Loveless and Mr. John Solomon. the summer of all happiness made winter by the sudden fierce attack. Our ship is under siege. I know not how. Oh, hast thou heard? The main reactor fails. We shall most surely be destroyed by this. I want madness lies herein. We're doomed. The princess shall have no escape this time. I fear this battle doth portend the end of the rebellion. Oh, what misery. Hold. Thou art not permitted to go in. Deactivated thou shalt surely be. Thou shalt not label me a mindless brute philosopher. Nay, nay. Thou overladen blob of grease. Thou in, thou rubbish bucket fit for scrap. Thou blue and silver pile of the dump. Now come, and get thee hence away, lest someone see. What secret mission and what plans? What dost thou talk about? I'll surely not get in. I won't I regret this, so say I. This golden joy has been a friend to his true, and yet I wish to still his prating tongue. An imp he calleth me? I shall be revenged upon this pompous droid C-3PO. Yet not in language shall my pranks be done. Around both droids and humans I must be seen to make such errant beeps and squeaks. That day shall think me simple. Although, though with sounds of bleak I speak to them, I clearly see how I must play my part, and how a vast rebellion shall succeed by wit and wisdom of a simple droid. Art is often portrayed as a dichotomy where two opposing forces are unable to exist in harmony. It's the entrenched hegemony of classical tale versus the subaltern seeking the new. However, this ignores the inherent dialectical nature of the evolution of art that the skills of the classics guide us to new discoveries. We can observe this by looking at author Ian Doshu's use of Shakespearean language to highlight the Shakespearean themes in George Lucas's Star Wars A New Hope. Through the meeting of these two classics, new art is created. William Shakespeare's Star Wars Verily A New Hope by Ian Doshu. Oh, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Help, help, not only help. Frank, what is this? Oh, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Help, thou art my only hope. Dear Master Luke, he says tis nothing, sir. A mere malfunction. By gone data tis. Please pay no mind. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Well, I suspect old Ben Kenobi he doth mean, perhaps. Now, enter I, the scene of this boy's life. This boy whom I've watched for many years hath grown into the man before me now. But by this light, his vein can will be here. It fills my heart with joy and soothes my pain to meet me. Tell me, hath thou done battle with Clone Wars? Aye, and once was I a Jedi Knight, the same as thy dear father. And I tell thee truly, amongst the pilots, was e'er he the greatest in the galaxy. He also was a cunning warrior. And to the last was he a dear, dear friend. Aye, tis well, but let us go hence. The juggling waste no place for travelers is. Now, pretty good young Luke, Say, wherefore art thou here? What strange errand bringeth thee herein, where I want to dwell? Ah, young Luke, most eyes in space <laughs> Never shalt thou we find a hive more rank and wretched, aye, and filled with villainy. So must we cautious be. I pray thee speak. How have long these droids? Tis three or mayhap four full seasons now. We are prepared to sell them, shouldst thou wish. Pray, show me thy papers. Nay, thou dost not need to see his papers. Nay, we do not need to see his papers. <laughs> the truth is, these are not the droids for which thou searchest. Ah, uh, these are not the droids for which we search. And now the lad may go his merry way. Good lad, I pray thee go my merry way. Now get thee hence. Now get thee hence, go hence. <laughs> the force has mighty power, the weak and simple-minded of this universe. <laughs> Chewbacca here, the service is first mate upon a ship that may our purpose meet. Han Solo at thy service, gentlemen. The great Millennium Falcon is my ship, 
My first mate, Chewy, telleth me ye seek safe passage to the system of Alderaan. Aye, if it is a vessel swift to fight. <laughs> this truly may my swift deliverance prove. Go thou unto the ship and be prepared. Now we followed hard upon by an imperial cruiser. Firstly, these passengers of great import must be, for they by the empire hotly are pursued. <laughs> Chewbacca, prithee, swift make our defense. Angle the deflector shield, whilst I'll make plain our calculations for light speed. <laughs> now dropping out of light speed's frantic rush, we enter swift into the area where there should be great Alderaan in view. <laughs> Imperial fighter tis, and the chase. Nay, nay, short range fighter tis. Oh, how this situation here does give me pause. Dost thou agree? A fighter this size, this deep in space, could not have come alone. Be like he's in a group and now it's lost? It shall not live to tell the tale today. Push me! He make his way to that small moon. I may play checkmate on him, near land. Why do we still approach? Alas, I sense the game and we're the pawns. That is no moon, tis a space station there. But praise of moon must not left to be. It had the advantage using a tractor beam to pull us in onto its landing bay. Uh, Prithee, what does all this beating mean? Master Luke, I confess, sir, I do not know. He hath declared, he hath found her. Then the droid repeats, she's here, she's here. But Mary who? Good Princess Leia. The droids, these droids are hers. What princess on thy life this thing unveil? Yet what I know is this. We must give her whatever of flaggy help and hope we may. Speak not with such great folly. Obi-Wan hath told us to remain. But knew he not that she was here? If thou must rescue her, thy great reward would be... Pray what? Well, pray more than thou hast imagined. Ha! Thou joust with me, for my imagination hath few bounds. <laughs> Alas, poor stormtrooper, I knew ye not. <laughs> Yet I have tamed both uniform and life in What manner of a man wert thou? A man with infinite jest or cruelty? A man with helpmate and children too? A man who served his empire with pride? Or a man who wished for eternal peace? Or whatever thy words, good man, thy pardon granted to the one who took thy place in thee. By Jody now. Obi Wan is here and with him is the force. If thou art right, he must not be allowed this station to escape. Nay, never, nay. Escape is not his plan. I must confront my former master, I must do it alone. For a certain I have waited, Obi-Wan, and at last the circles of our lives are now complete. A student was I when I left thee last, but now I am the master over thee. <laughs> <laughs> thou art the master, I know tis true, dog. But only evil hast thou mastered yet. <laughs> In time, my powers have become weak, old man. And yet thou canst not win, I won't, Doc. For if thou strike me down in now and here, I shall more great and powerful become than e'er thou hast imagined possible. Nay! Ray, run, Luke, run! <laughs> Friends, brothers, starfighters, bend me your ear. Wish not we had a single fighter more. If we are locked to die, we're enough to make our planets proud. Oh, use the force, dear Luke. Let go and trust. I really all shall be well. <laughs> now marks the day with the son of peace, a day where the rebels welcome fate. For from their enemies they find release, and now with mirth they come to celebrate. Young Luke, strong in the force, doth walk beside the noble Han whose valor won the day. The rebels form an isle and rise with pride as Luke and Han march forth in grand display. Now Leia smiles and gives each the reward as each bells low with hope and joy sincere. C-3PO and R2 now restored, look on as Brace Chewbacca sounds the cheer. <laughs> there our heroes rest free from attack. Till darkness rise and empire striketh back.
for a brief little commercial. As some of you may know, the speech department has begun a tutoring program here on campus as well, over in the new library. And we now have two specific tutors at your convenience to hopefully help you through your classes. Uh, and you've actually seen both of them today. The very first student who was introduced with the speech team, Melinda Dotson, is one of your speech tutors. And then your next speaker, James Baugh, is the second speech tutor. So if you're looking for assistance and some extra guidance, please feel free to call in and make appointments or try to drop in and see them. They'll help you with your classes, definitely. They'll help you get through things, answer questions for you. The next performance that we have for you is a persuasive speech from James Baugh, an individual who has taken several awards in Northern California with this speech. A persuasive speech certainly is a speech that is designed to persuade an audience to change your point of view or take action against something. And so if all of you would take out your wallets and look at those dollar bills that you have, James has a very bright idea with those bills that you'll find out with his speech. So please give a round of applause to Mr. James Ball. Imagine a fertile farmland viable to grow crops. Now, imagine that land being used to grow cotton, 90% of which we know will end up in landfills in the next five years. Finally, imagine that land being bigger than the combined landmass of all of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Unfortunately, this isn't something we need to imagine. It's happening right now. According to statistics from the National Cotton Council in 2013, the United States uses as much as 16,170 acres of land to grow the cotton we need to make $1 bills. According to wheatfoods.org, last accessed on January 24, 2014, that land, that land could be growing as much as 101 million one-pound loaves of bread. That extra food could do wonders for our country, considering that according to Feeding America, last accessed on January 23, 2014, as much as 15% of our nation and over 1.5 million children in California alone lived in food insecurity in 2013. Instead, we used that land to produce $1 bills, holding us back from not only higher levels of food and economic production, but hurting our environment and costing taxpayers a fortune through the dollar bill's inefficient and counterproductive qualities. Fortunately, a USA Today article from July 23, 2013, reveals a plan to free up this land and save our government billions, switching from the paper dollar to the dollar coin. Experts estimate the savings of this wish could climb as high as $13 billion over the next 30 years. This shows that in following in the footsteps of many of the world's other major economies, there are numerous benefits to the United States in switching to the dollar coin in terms of our budget, our economy, and even our natural resources. To understand where these benefits come from, we must first look at the reasons why we have, so far, avoided switching from the dollar bill. Second, understand the effects of the transition to the coin. And finally, implement solutions that will allow us to fully reap the benefits of having a more efficient dollar. So if switching to the coin is so good, why haven't we done it already? There are three main reasons perpetuating our love of the paper dollar. The initial cost of coin production, the cost of businesses, and public opinion. But let's start with the coins. According to a 2012 report from the Government Accountability Office, or the GAO, the initial cost of producing enough coins to fully phase out the dollar bill would run somewhere around $600 million. The main concern about this cost is that since the savings are projected to take place over 30 years, these initial time estimates could be inaccurate. If that happens, it could take much longer than originally thought to recover this initial cost. Second, there's the cost of businesses. In the same GAO report, major stockholders identified potential costs that could arise as a result of the change to the coin. The short-term costs were upfront and obvious. Businesses would need to upgrade their coin storage capacity in order to accommodate the large influx of dollar coins. 
They would also need to upgrade or modify any machines that don't currently accept the dollar coin. However, in time for change, a 2013 report by former Treasury Department Assistant Secretary Aaron Klein, this cost is shown to be small, as all government agencies and federally operated machines already accept the coin, as well as any machine produced in the last 20 years by the National Automated Merchandising Association. In addition to this, the 2011 Wisconsin State Journal identified a long-term cost to the transportation industry in the form of heavier truckloads from carrying more dollar coins, resulting in lower gas mileage and higher fuel costs. Finally, there's public opinion. Americans just waver on scrapping the greenback. According to a 2011 Lincoln Park Strategies poll, as much as 77% of Americans are shown to be against using the dollar coin and only 10% think switching would help our economy. However, Philip Deal, former director of the US Mint, said that after learning of the potential savings of the switch, two thirds of Americans were actually on board with it. The power of public opinion has often proven itself to be crucial when it comes to big changes in society. And right now, it is overwhelmingly against the dollar coin. While the resistance to change might be strong, the benefits of switching over are too great to ignore including the environmental impacts, the long-term savings to our government, and the significant economic stimulation. First, the environment. American paper currency is 25% linen and 75% cotton. Unfortunately, cotton is one of the world's dirtiest crops. According to a 2013 report from Living Green Magazine, cotton is responsible for 16% of all insecticide use and over 90% of the pesticides used in cotton farming rate as above highly hazardous by the World Health Organization. In addition to this, this linen cotton blend of the dollar bill ensures that only 10% of each bill is recyclable, in contrast to a 100% recycle rate for the dollar coin. It's estimated in time for change that the amount of landfill waste generated by 30 years of production of the dollar bill would accumulate up to 164,000 700 metric tons of waste, the same amount produced by the entire city of Cincinnati last year. Switching to the dollar coin not only reduces our cotton use, but also greatly reduces our contribution to landfills. Second, there are large scale economic benefits to our government in switching to the dollar coin. Printing the dollar bill is horribly inefficient. According to the US Bureau of Engraving and Printing, in 21 of the last 22 years, the dollar bill was the most produced bill, and over half of the bills produced in 2011. This popularity leads to a short lifespan, only between five and six years, according to the Federal Reserve. The dollar coin, on the other hand, is much more cost efficient. While it costs more per unit to produce, 18 cents to the dollar bill's nine cents, the US Mint estimates the lifespan of the coin at between 25 and 30 years, five times that of its paper counterpart. It's estimated that just from the switch to the coin, our government can save as much as $13.8 billion over the next 30 years. Furthermore, the denomination effect, established in a 2009 study by NYU Stern School of Business, shows that people are actually much more likely to spend coins than they are to spend bills, and spend more money when shopping with coins versus shopping with bills. In the first phase of the study, 63% of people given four quarters spent money while shopping, in comparison to only 21% of those who were shopping with the dollar bill. In the second phase of the study, owners of five $1 bills spent on average $4.13 at a convenience store. Owners of five $1 coins, on the other hand, spent on average $4.32, a 5% overall spending increase. This study shows a strong correlation between coin money and increased consumer spending, which is undoubtedly good for our economy. The other side of this growth comes from the vending machine industry. It's actually much easier for a machine to process a coin than it is to process a bill. In fact, the Dollar Coin Alliance estimated in 2013 that just from the switch to the coin, our vending machine industry would save hundreds of millions of dollars a year from not having $1 bills jam up in their machines and require maintenance. So by now it should be clear that there are numerous benefits in switching to the dollar coin. So let's look at some solutions to help make that a reality. Right now there is a bill that will switch us to the dollar coin. 
The 2013 Currency Optimization, Innovation, and National Savings Act, or COINS Act. You should contact your congressperson immediately and instruct your representative to vote in favor of the COINS Act to the benefit of both our economy and our environment. Second, we should all become more vested in the dollar coin. Actively asking for the coin from your bank can help increase the demand for this type of currency. We can't just be in favor of the switch to the coin in a poll. We have to seek out and use these coins to show our representatives that we want this transition. 16,170. That's how many acres of land we could be using to grow food to help feed the hungry people in this nation and regrow our economy. But instead, we use it to produce a costly and inefficient form of currency. Today, we looked at how you can help take steps towards a better form of currency by switching from the paper dollar to the dollar coin. We've examined the barriers generating resistance to this change, counted the numerous beneficial effects of switching over, and even discovered some solutions to help encourage this shift in policy. Switching to the dollar coin won't solve all of this country's problems overnight, but it is an example of the type of intelligent policy making our government has been sorely lacking to bring us out of this current crisis. The, the extra food we grow from this change might not reach every hungry household in America, but those families who do break from food insecurity as a result of switching to the dollar coin will see their lives break for the will see their lives change for the better. As for once, their government counted them and made them a priority. Our next performance this evening is being done by a young lady who has been on the speech scene for the past two years. And right now, at this moment, she is the community college champion in Northern California for the after dinner speech. An after dinner speech is an informative or persuasive speech. But what makes it different is that it's supposed to be funny. And so, as being known as the funniest woman in Northern California for community college students, please give a round of applause to Emily Akers. As a little girl, one question I probably heard the most growing up was, do you want like Barbies with me? My answer was always, no. It's not that I thought that I was above playing with the other snot-covered children. It's just that logically, Barbie did not make sense in my mind, especially when they came out with astronaut Barbie. Because what I thought was, how the hell are you going to spend years on countless hour training days, then blast yourself up into space while wearing pink pumps, a metallic hot pants spacesuit, and perfectly applied mascara? As I grew up, though, I started to realize that Barbie faces a lot of the same issues that women do today. Thanks to the women's movement, society has taken us out of the kitchen because that's where the knives are. <laughs> and you know we'll cut you. <laughs> and we've made a name for ourselves in the work world. However, the pressure to do it all has left me on most mornings filling my kitchen sink up with coffee, dunking my head in, and just sucking. <laughs> On some special mornings, I like to throw a few shots of vodka in there. <laughs> like this morning. <laughs> in her 2013 book, Wonder Women, Sex, Power, and the Quest for Perfection, Deborah Spar explains that the idea of feminism has somehow evolved into the superwoman myth, where you do it all, and you have it all, in a manner so flawless and sexy that Beyonce herself would have nodded her head and whispered, fierce. <laughs> and being a superwoman is a standard that the majority of women today are desperately trying to meet. So in the next few minutes, we'll slip into our stilettos in order to reveal the causes behind the superwoman myth. Next, we'll strut into our corner office in order to examine its effects, before finally making it to our son's soccer game on time in order to yell at the rap for some solutions. But first, the causes. Who's responsible for the superwoman myth? The Illuminati. <laughs> yeah, wake up, America. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but for real. 
From the late 1950s all the way to present day, feminism has filtered through the media, resulting in the superwoman myth. In an article for CNN on June 25, 2012, fellow feminist Stephanie Koontz explains that it's important to realize that the women's movement never told anybody that they could have it all. That wasn't the concept of feminist activists, but rather the brainchild of advertising executives. And as much as I wanted my life to be more like a TV show, Mad Men was never really my first choice. I was really hoping more for a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I would be a bomb splinter. Some of you are starting to take the knife joke a little more seriously, huh? And in a 2012 forum discussion titled Post Feminism, the Market and the Media, Dr. Cynthia Carter explains that in most cases, the media has exploited the image of the liberated woman in order to sell. Advertisements, as well as television and movies, have constantly adapted the image of a successful woman to someone with briefcase and baby in hand, who has enough time to compete in organic cupcake baking competitions and is clearly jacked up on Botox. <laughs> the result is a misinterpretation of feminism, which turns women's fo focus inwards on their own path towards perfection. And as the media was busy building superwoman expectations, gender roles did not undergo the necessary shift in order to support women who were breadwinners with a family. The LA Times on October 8, 2013 explains that some of the same old gender roles are still in effect. Citing a study which found that in dual income families, women logged more than twice as many hours on household and caregiving tasks than men did. So, because I have the boobs, I have to watch the kids and wash the dishes, right? Well, that is just so 1950s of you. Vintage. So adorable. <laughs> now that we know the causes behind the superwoman myth, we can now examine some of its effects. Do you have them? You didn't bring the effects? Oh no, don't get up, honey. I'll get those too. The high expectations set on women have left a majority of them feeling absolutely inadequate. The Chronicle Review on September 6, 2013 explains that women are repeatedly berating themselves for not living up to the superwoman expectation. Furthermore, the media and women at large experience a sudden outburst of crap talking any time a high profile woman hits a snack. My favorite example being my girl, Hillary Clinton. Now Hillary Clinton, besides being my spirit animal, is one of, is one of the most successful and influential women of our time. She's held a variety of different political positions and is actually cited to be a qualified choice for president by both Democrats and some Republicans, which is like one of the only things some of them can agree on. However, we often only hear things like, oh my god guys, did you see Hillary Clinton's pants suit? And why is Hillary Clinton basically like a man? And perhaps the most popular, Hillary's hair? Ew. <laughs> Hillary herself has voiced to multiple news pieces that it's really stupid to be talking about a female politician's hair when they're busy doing, oh, I don't know, maybe like actual important stuff. <laughs> and high profile women aren't the only ones struggling with this. The pressure to be perfect affects women on all levels of the professional world. In November of 2012, Forbes cited a study of 4,000 college educated professionals and 200 senior executives where a majority agreed that women in the workplace are still heavily judged by physical attractiveness, slimness, youthful appearance, and expensive, cl expensive clothing. Which is cool, though, because I have all those. <laughs> Besides inadequate feelings, women trying to uphold a career and take primary responsibility for childcare are starting to create diminishing returns for all working women. The previously cited Chronicle Review states that women are being affected in their professional lives by a variety of household and caregiving issues. For example, showing up to work without sleep because you had to check under the bed for the boogeyman 102 times last night, <laughs> leading them to settle for lower paying part-time jobs, like being a Hooters girl. Ah, <laughs> uh, Hooters. The food sucks, but mmm, bright orange camel toe. <laughs> Together. The LA Times on October 8, 2012 explains that without women in these power positions pushing for change, employers have no incentive to alter workplace practices on being more woman or family friendly. And this isn't sending a hopeful message to the next generation of female high achievers.
Now that we understand the causes and the effects behind the superwoman myth, we can now take off our bras. <laughs> and set them on fire! To illuminate the solutions. <laughs> bras are restrictive. <laughs> to debunk the superwoman myth, we need to take a throwback to what feminism truly intended. Feminism was meant to free women from unreasonable social standards, but instead, we place new ones on ourselves in the struggle to be perfect. We all know that no one is perfect, and life isn't a fairy tale. So if you lose one of your shoes at midnight, you should probably lay off the tequila. <laughs> and the jello shots. <laughs> and the Jager bombs. <laughs> That's not just me, right? <laughs> Spar's previously cited book explains that we should take our focus off of our own path towards perfection and turn our attention towards supporting the few brave women running for office or pushing in the fight for more equal pay and family-friendly workplaces. But until we obtain these things, gender roles need to continue evolving to meet the needs of working families. CNN on April 9, 2013 states that in order to achieve greater equity, Men will need to reallocate some more time towards household and caregiving tasks so that women can have more time for economic advancement. Men just need to realize that no one is going to look down on them for pitching in on more housewife work. I mean, I honestly think it's damn sexy when a man does the dishes <laughs> and only an apron. <laughs> if we can do these things, maybe one day being a superwoman will seem like less of a myth, but more of something we can actually obtain. Like weed. Hashtag plays it. In the, next, in the last few minutes, we examined the causes, effects, and some solutions to this crazy superwoman myth. You know, looking back on it, maybe I was a little harsh on Barbie. You know, I should have supported her for being a female astronaut in the first place. Although I'm still skeptical on whether or not you can go into space with stilettos on. I do know one thing for sure, though. Mattel should have made a Hillary Clinton Barbie. I definitely would have played with her. One of the most intimidating forms of public speaking is a speech where you have to come up right off the top of your head and put that speech together. In competition, we call that impromptu speaking. In my class, Speech 100, certainly my students will be going through impromptu speeches as well. In competition, an impromptu speech is a speech where the student has two minutes to put together a five-minute speech. Jacob Holman has been doing impromptu speeches for the speech team over the past two years and is certainly one of the most honored that we have on this team. Throughout the entire fall and the beginning of this spring semester, he has been competing against students from the University of Pacific and the University of California at Berkeley and competing right side by side by them and taking awards. An impromptu speech, again, is a speech where they don't know what the topics are. They're handed the topics. They then have two minutes, and then they give their speech. Earlier, you might have heard the name Nicole Klenker, but Nicole Klenker is one of the members of the speech team, and if she'll stand up and wave to the audience. She is part of our speech team, and she will be Jacob's timer to keep him on track with his times so that we come up with ideas that are fresh out of the audience. The audience has no idea if they're gonna do this. As you guys were all coming in, I kind of noticed some of the people who are here, and I'm gonna ask people right now to help me out with topics. They don't even know that I'm gonna do this. <laughs> but Ms. Dadal, Ms. Dadal, I know you're back there in that corner. Can you just shout out for me a color? Blue. <laughs> Your voice has gotten really deep. <laughs> but I'll take blue. <laughs> Mr. Honor, I know you're out there. Yes. Where, oh yeah, there we go. Can you give me just an abstract item? Abstract painting. Painting? An abstract painting? All right, I'll go for that. 
And Eliza with a Z, Eliza Payne. I know you're out there. Hi. Hey. How about an Olympic event? Curling. Curling. Why do I do that? Because I know Jacob wasn't thinking curling at all. And so for the next two minutes, if you kind of keep it quiet so that Jacob can concentrate, and his time starts now. film that was produced in, as propaganda in order to build support for the Secret Service. Now, there was a young boy who watched this film, and what happened in the film was that the Secret Service agent takes a bullet for the president. Now, the boy who saw this film was so enthralled by this that he decided that he was going to become a Secret Service agent himself, and he ended up going and actually becoming one and getting to work for the president. And this is the first thing that came to mind when I received the prompt curling. Now, what curling means to me in this case is that we need to go the distance because even though it's not typically seen as one of our more go-getter events, as it were, in order to win, you still have to go the distance. And I completely agree with this. Because if we do not go the distance for others around us, then, we, then no one will go the distance for them. And we're going to be seeing this through three main points of analysis. First, we'll be seeing this through a famous historical person. Then, we'll be looking at this through a book. And then finally, we'll be looking at this through a recent movie. So let's look to our famous person. Winston Churchill. We shall fight on the landing grounds and on the beaches. We shall fight, but we shall never give up. We shall never surrender. Winston Churchill, a phenomenal public speaker and a phenomenal leader. When Germany was encroaching on Europe and the rest of the civilized world, as it were, Winston Churchill was one of the few individuals who managed to hold it together and go the distance. Because if he had not gone the distance, if he had not kept himself together in order to fend off against Hitler until the United States came into the war, which he continually pleaded for them to come in, but he kept going until they did. However, it was because he held his ground, it was because that he continued to fight against Nazi Germany, that Nazi Germany was eventually able to be defeated, and freedom was able to continue throughout the world. Now, if Winston Churchill had not done this, we would probably have a much heavier influence in our world today from Nazi Germany. 
And so because of this, Winston Churchill going the distance has greatly benefited each and every single person in this room today. Now let's look to our book. Artemis Fowl, the series, is about a young boy who is extremely brilliant. This child of 12 years old has the mind of someone far beyond his years. In fact, the majority of times when he goes to have his works published, he actually has to do this under a false identity because no one would believe that the ideas and the brilliance coming from this person could come from a child. Now, during his adventures and his times, he ends up having a, an adventure with the fairy people who are in the book series. Now, Artemis is trying to get as much gold as he can from the fairies because his father has been kidnapped. And he's trying to find his father, and his father is the most important thing in the world to him. And so he has to go through a whole bunch of trials and tribulations in order to get the gold from the fairies and out with them and ultimately get that gold. And he ultimately gets his father back. And it's because he goes the distance here that he's able to get his father back, that he's able to set his world to rights. And so if this had not happened, then Artemis would undoubtedly never have gotten the peace that he got from having his world reordered. And finally, we're going to be looking at this through the new movie Haunter. Now, the main character is a young girl, about 15, 16 years old. And as you progress throughout the story, you find out that she's actually a ghost. Now, what makes this interesting is that there's a series of ghosts throughout this timeline that are interacting with each other, and it's only through her actions that they're able to be released. And at one point later in the film, she ends up having to make a, ch a tough decision in order to choose whether or not she's going to go off with the rest of her family to be released, or if she's going to stay behind to allow the other ghosts to be able to relieve, be relieved as well. She chooses to relieve the other ghosts, and it's because she makes this choice to go the distance that she ultimately benefits them. So today, we first talked about Winston Churchill and how he went the distance. Then, we talked about Artemis Fowl and how he went the distance for his family. And finally, we talked about the movie Haunter and how this girl goes the distance for many other people. So when we look back to the story in the beginning, about the young boy who became a Secret Service agent. The, per the person who played the president was Ronald Reagan during his early acting career. And the boy who saw the film was Ronald Reagan's Secret Service agent who actually ended up taking the bullet for him. He went the distance so that way Ronald Reagan would live. Our last performance of the evening, the piece de resistance, is the parliamentary debate. Parliamentary debate for Manessa Junior College is extremely important because, in essence, there was a gentleman who was my predecessor, Professor Dr. Ewing, who actually discovered parliamentary debate by going over to Britain and on a sabbatical and watching debates over there. And he brought this process back to the United States. And once he then introduced it to the debate community, the competitive debate community, then all of a sudden the entire nation started to fall in love with this style of debate. One of the things that makes this debate unique is that in the debate, the students don't know what their topic is until about 15 minutes before they have to do the debate. They have 15 minutes to prepare their arguments, and then they come together with a judge, and they put that all together and all on the line. Modesto Junior College, since parliamentary debate has been introduced in the competitive field, 
has been one of the top schools in the nation, and we can consistently produce the top teams. Right now, right here at Modesto Junior College, we have five different teams, 10 people who are considered the top teams in the entire state. And in the middle of March, we'll be going to the state championships to prove that Modesto Junior College is the best debate school in California to move on to nationals and show that we have the top 10 debaters in the entire nation. Two of those debaters are on my left, and they are the affirmative team. They will be supporting the claim that I say to you, and that is Mr. Michael Warwick and Ms. Rachel Carr. Both of these individuals have taken debate awards throughout the season and also speaker awards as debaters. But to my right, the opposition team, Ms. Kelly Kearley and Ms. Carissa Autry, right now, as I mentioned earlier, are second in the entire nation for community college debaters. For all the ladies out there, the most unique thing about this team is that very rarely in the entire history of competitive debate, and we go back into the 1800s, are there two women who are on the same team as champions? And that's what we're going to be bringing home to you at the end of April. Now the other interesting thing about parliamentary debate is parliamentary debate is actually based off of the British Parliament. And one of the most important things about the British Parliament is that the audience is involved in the debate. So that as an audience, whenever you hear an argument that you really like, feel free to say, hey, hey, hear, hear, or, or pound the seat in front of you. You know, if you don't like the person sitting in front of you, feel free to do that. You know? It's allowable tonight. Don't hit them, just the seat. So this evening, the debate topic that you will come to appreciate is that the National Football League should eliminate Washington's name and logo. Let's introduce a uh, speaker, Prime Minister, Four Minute Constructive, Rachel Farr. one, the resolution analysis. The resolution that we're looking at today, the NFL is justified in changing the Washington Redskins name and logo. The definitions will be contextual because we all understand the words in the resolution and there's no other way to really interpret this. This is going to be a value round because of the subjective wording in the resolution, such as the terms justified. In this round, we'll look to the value of respect, which means that all of the points made in this round must be filtered through this value in order to be weighed in the round. We chose this value for three reasons. Me and my partner chose this value because we, we're, we are the affirmative team and we have the right to do that. Yay! <laughs> Two, um, because this value is most important to the issue and because this value is used when talking about the issue in the media so we know that it's current. And the third point is that it provides the most grounds for argumentation since we all understand it. It is broad enough to include all arguments. On observation two, contention one, racism. The thesis is the logo and the name of the rights is inherently racist and offensive. The warrants, the first two warrants that we'll see is that um, they'll elaborate on why the name is offensive, and warrants three and four will elaborate on how come the logo is offensive. So on to the warrant one of the history of the name. The name of the Redskins is so offensive to Native Americans because it was used to identify and group Native Americans. Uh, there's also historical references in like an 1863 newspaper um, that even indicates that the term Redskins was used to refer to the bloody scalps of Native Americans um, that the state would reward $200 for per scalp. This state literally referred to the bloody scalps of Native Americans as a red skin. Just think about how horribly offensive this is to them. I'll wait. Is it sinking in how offensive this is? Native Americans, Native Americans' names appear to have been chosen to emphasize the Americanness of the team and its patriotic character. 
But we shouldn't associate the Americanness of the culture, we shouldn't associate Americanness with the culture that was devastated by Americans. On to contention two of that of the tribe's opinion, or uh, the warrant to a tribe's opinion. Of the two million Native Americans enrolled in 566 federally um, recognized tribes, nearly all of them find this offensive. The National Congress of American Indians states that the Indian mascots and logos perpetuate racism and bigotry. If the Native Americans find this offensive, who are we to tell them that this isn't offensive and it's something that they shouldn't worry about? The next two warrants will be on how come the logo is so offensive. Um, the headdress, or warrant three. The logo includes a Native American wearing a headdress. I don't know if you can see it up there. But this has led to fans wearing in a mockery during sporting events while drinking and watching the game as a sign of allegiance to the team, even though it's culturally insensitive. The headdress of Native Americans, especially the feathers, are sacred to Native Americans. Um, while wearing the headdress, the wearer must obtain from any form of influence, so drinking while wearing the headdress is uniquely offensive to them. Racial stereotyping, inaccurate racial portrayals, and cultural appropriation, especially when the members of the cultural protest it, is not respectful in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. The fourth point is going to be that of the mascot. The mascot of the Redskins always acts barbaric, wild, and savage to represent the team's attitude in the game, but since they're using a Native American mascot, this entrenches the stereotypes. And in September 2008, the Dallas Cowboys mascot jumped the Washington's mascot um, and pretended to beat him up. So by changing the logo, we'll have to change the mascot, which leads to less racially insensitive acts on the field. To further prove the point that the name of the logo are racist, I'd like to bring up the racist cartoons that originated in the 1930s that showed racially insensitive figures. These cartoons just perpetuated stereotypes, and to modern audiences, they're quite shocking and illustrate how persuasive and institutionalized racism was in our culture just a short time ago. We recognize that the illustrations are wrong, so why is it okay for us to have a Native American um, symbolic cartoon represent an American football team. Here, here. For these reasons, we're going to change. We're going to see that the change to the name and the logo of the Washington Redskins is definitely justified. And you're going to vote for the affirmative. Thank you. So welcome, welcome up, Carissa Autry, leader of the opposition for a four-minute construction. has the burden to completely prove the resolution true in all aspects of the resolution. It is the job of the negative team to disprove the resolution in any way they can. And we're going to be doing this through two pieces of analysis tonight, plus a little bit of argumentation against their case. So on to contention, or counter contention one, changing the name and the logo is not justified. So our thesis of this argument is that as a negative team, we recognize the negative aspects of the name Redskins. I mean, we all know it's kind of offensive. Um, but we were we don't really think that the logo itself is either offensive or derogatory to the culture, and it should be kept. I mean, they, are, they reference this as a cartoon. This is not a cartoon. It is a completely accurate representation of what a Native American in history looked like. It's not a cartoon. Um, so when you go on to the warrants, basically the first is that the logo can be kept to positively represent the culture. The second argument is that the brand power of this team is huge. They are third in the United States, only below the Cowboys and the Patriots. Changing the logo puts the team at risk of losing $131 million. And the third point is that this change would not account for old merchandise, but it, and it doesn't value use. So this is only going to supercharge the fact that the people are going to want to wear their old brand, and they're going to want to uh, support their history and tradition of their team, which is going to create this old, like, remember the good old days when we could actually call our team the Redskins and wear what we wanted to to support our team and the history. So it's just going to supercharge the racism that they're already trying to claim. And so moving forward from this, like we have to get rid of the name, but not the logo, because it's not going to change anything. So when you look into the value of respect today, if you want to respect the people, allow them to be correctly represented in the limelight, but don't let them be called something that is completely racist. This is why they're not completely proving the resolution true. Onto the second contention or counter contention of the NFL making the change is not justified. When you go to the thesis, basically, we see that if the NFL makes the change, it will not be justified. The warrants under this are the one. The change would not come from within the organization itself. So it's kind of like when you were a little kid and your mom made you apologize to your brother or sister when you hurt their feelings. 
everyone knows that you weren't actually sorry. The, in, the Native Americans are going to know that the team isn't actually sorry and that they don't, they don't really care about their feelings. So when you go down to the two, I'm giving the NFL power to set a precedence. This is going to create a culture of power that is going to uh, destroy movements that come from within and it's going to increase hate for all politically conscious causes. So the tie back for this is that for these two reasons, we can see that letting the NFL make the change would not be justified because it does not uphold respect for the Native American cultures. On to, <laughs> on to contention one of racism. The fact that they say that the logo and name is racist, as you can see through my first content, counter contention, it's not. Um, but they say that the, they use it to identify groups and to, like, to represent scouts. Okay, so one and two, yeah, we say the name is bad. We're agreeing the name is bad, but that's why we only want to change the logo. So when you go down to their third point, you're saying that the mockery is made because of the headdresses and how people are drinking and making fools of themselves. Everyone makes fools of themselves. They're not purposely doing it to hurt the culture of the people. And they're not using the headdresses in the same way that the Native American culture does use the headdresses, so it's not offensive in the same way. When they're saying that the mascot acts barbaric and that a cowboy jumped a redskin mascot, um, turn, that's a good thing. If we want to end racism towards the uh, Redskins, we're saying like the Cowboys are bad, so why not change the Cowboys mascot then? I mean, if the Cowboys are hurting the Redskins, maybe they can something about the Cowboys. George Preston Marshall changed the name to the Redskins to honor head coach William Henry Lone Star Geeks. The change was made to avoid confusion between the Boston Braves baseball team and the currently named Boston Braves Reds, like the current Redskins. So the change was made to honor the coach who claimed that he was a Sioux Indian. It's still in controversy of whether or not he actually was. But the change to the name Redskins is actually made for a good reason. So we need to keep the culture of the Indians, or Native Americans, I'm so sorry, to not be politically correct. <laughs> they changed the name of the Native Americans to actually represent our culture correctly and do something about it that we can actually fix. Next speaker, for Michael Ward, a member of the uh, member of the opposition for a woman speech. Or member of the government, sorry. All right, y'all ready? Yeah. 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 All right, we're going to start this debate by kind of putting some names for the teams in a football context. So I think we should call the opposition team the Broncos. I think we should call the affirmative team the Seahawks. I think it's a good representation of this debate. So let's get into it. First, let's go into the observation. My observation was the thesis of the opposition is saying. First is that they're saying that NFL will lose money. So basically they're saying it's too expensive to be racist. Uh, second is that they say the logo is not offensive in their opinion. Because, you know, they're Indian. Next is going to be uh, it's, it's actually, my bad, backwards. Let's talk about how the NFL is bad and changing the name. Uh, they say it's not the NFL's job, it should come from within, but my response is that Democratic Senator from Washington State, Maria Cantwell, who is also the chairman of the Indian Affairs Committee, demanded change from the NFL because that's their job. They're in an oversight position. Uh, the team itself is not in charge of penalizing its own, uh, own uh, players and not have to deal with any of its name. The NFL is the one who's in charge of the name. Next on the argument, they say how we shouldn't force our kids, or, I mean, excuse me, yes, how, how a coach shouldn't force its students to, to apologize, oh, I, oh, sorry, how a parent shouldn't force one of its uh, kids to apologize, it's not genuine. So I guess you, if you're a parent, should never force your kid to apologize, and I could look with that parenting strategy. <laughs> the next thing I'm not sure is that, huh, this is actually worse. Daniel Snyder, the owner of the Washington Redskins, says this is a badge of honor to use the name Redskins. What would you rather have? A kid who's not genuine in his apology, or a kid who makes an apology and then takes honor in the offense that he just gave? Yeah. Next is going to say it sets a bad precedent, and that is a bad precedent because the NFL is overlord. I didn't really get it. But the argument here I'm saying this it sets a good precedent, uh, precedent of the NFL because that's, it shows the other teams that if they use offensive behavior or use offensive names in their teams, that they will be cracked down upon by the NFL. All right, let's move on to contention number two of we shouldn't change the logo. The first argument they gave is this is a positive representation of Indians. Uh, my response is who thinks it's a positive representation? White people. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> the tells you that two million Indians and 566 uh, uh, tribes find this offensive. We don't, just, we don't get to decide what's offensive to Indians. Say, oh, it's not offensive. It, it's actually better for you. And they're like, no, it's offensive. Who can listen to? Next, let's go down and say we lose a lot of money. 
so we should still be racist. But my response <laughs> is that Maria Campbell, who I just talked about earlier, said that the NFL will lose even more money because the exemptions that they're getting is based on the fact that they don't have racist behavior or racist language in their names. It means that they would lose those exemptions and lose billions of dollars. So guess what? It's actually more expensive to be racist. Surprise! <laughs> Honestly, I say I was supercharged it because people will be more attached to it. We can look to the example of the Washington Bullets. Anybody remember that name? Really? Is there not? Yeah, exactly. That means that when a name is taken off and so is a logo, that means everything goes with it. There's no, there's no representation of, of this in the Redskins that will be left after we get rid of the logo. No one will be attached to it. If, if I'm wrong, then I dare you to remember the name of the Washington Bullets. Let's go to the, our contention. They take on down, going down, they say that this is not on purpose, that the drink is not on purpose. So I guess it has to be intentional, intentional to be offensive, huh? You can, if it's not intentional, then it's not racist. They say that using this logo is racist, therefore it is offensive to them. Also, go where they say, oh man, oh. They said that to be having a Dallas Cowboy mascot jump a Washington Redskin and, and pretend to beat him is actually a good thing? Oh my gosh. <laughs> They're saying that this entrenches racism even further, saying, ha ha, it's funny that this cowboy is jumping at Indian and beating him up. Kind of like the good old days, huh? <laughs> these are all reasons why you're going to be voting. Actually, these are all the reasons why you're going to be going, kind of betting on the Seahawks and not riding with the Broncos. Thank you. <laughs> When Michael comes up and says that the Democratic senator demanded change from the NFL because that's their job, yes, it might be their job to change the name, which we are conceding to the fact that yes, it is racist, but they aren't talking about whatsoever that it's, the, that it's their job to also change the logo. We're saying that it's bad to change the logo, like my partner talked about before, because because the logo that is up here, it's a drawing. It's not a caricature that is, that's meant to be racist whatsoever. And so, yes, the racism might be happening through the NFL, or through the name of the Washington Mexicans, but it's not happening with the, with the logo. And so, then Michael also comes up and says that who thinks that this is, that this is a positive rep representation of Indian, or of Native Americans? And he said that it's white people. No. I, Basically, long story short, when Michael came up and I believe Rachel also came up and talked about how that 90% of Native Americans want the Washington Redskins name changed. They weren't talking about the logo whatsoever. It's the burden of the affirmative team to, to prove that it's important to change both the name and the logo. Yes, we're saying that the name is okay, but the logo doesn't need to be changed because there have been no issues with the logo whatsoever. And... the Washington Bullets, and he was asking, have any of you heard about the Washington Bullets? No. Why? And he said that it's because it's good that they got banned, but no. Their, their name changed, and just to give you a little bit of history on this, it wasn't because everyone was like, oh, great, since the name got changed, we're not going to wear that apparel anymore. That's not what happened whatsoever. People kept wearing the Washington Bullets apparel, and to the point where they're, uh, to where the Washington Bullets apparel was completely banned from showing up to any NFL games whatsoever, and so that's why no one has heard of them anymore, is because it's been completely banned. So that has nothing, and also I just want to point out again, nothing to do with the logo, just about the name. So that really they don't prove anywhere whatsoever on how both the logo and the name needs to be changed. They just talk about the logo. Um, going on to how Michael brings up, or how Rachel brought up about with the, this is an accurate representation of cultural behaviors of people wearing the headdress. Basically, they're saying that yes, this is bad. That the that the cultural behaviors are being. Here, here. 
Basically what's happening is that these people that are wearing the headdresses, they're not drinking to hurt the culture while they're wearing the headdresses. They're wearing these headdresses because that is a part of what the team represents. And this is only going to be worse and, worse and worse unless we only change the name, not the logo. Um, we talked about how the mascot always acts barbaric, and they gave an example of where the where the Native American was attacking another team, and my partner brought up how this is a good thing because how this is a good thing, and and it, because it makes the Cowboys look bad. But on top of that, they, they just gave one example of when the of when the Native American team was always acting barbaric. So because of that, we can't really trust that there's any any other examples if they're only able to give one specific example to when this has been happening to begin with, and. Other than that, I just want to reiterate what my partner talked about, how the name has been changed to honor the coach who said that he was a, Na who he was a part of the Native American culture to begin with. And so for all these reasons, please vote for the Native team. Thanks. We have a two-minute rebuttal by the leader of the opposition, Chris Autry. <laughs> All right, so I'd just like to reiterate once again, the fact that in a value round, all we have to do is disprove the resolution in any way possible is going to be why you're going to be casting a vote for the negative team today. When you look to counter contention one, when you say that changing the name and the logo is not justified, basically the only argumentation they gave you was that um, the name is bad, and white people think the name is good, and that the logo is not bad. But we give you plenty of argumentation as to why the logo is not the problem, it's the name, and why if we change the logo, they get up and give you all this argumentation that you think is going to be like, cool, you're going to vote on it. Really all they do is make you laugh with their argumentation. That's not a reason to be voting on something today, especially when it's an issue like racism. Racism, is it great? No, it's not. Why are we making fun of it? So when you go on to the fact that they said that um, when, you ban a, when you ban a name, everything goes away with it. No. That's not the way it is. You have to like ban everything for it to go away, not just the logo. So when you go down and you see the fact that when it ties back to uh, respect, getting rid of the logo isn't going to represent respect. Getting rid of the name will. This is why upholding the resolution today, they are not going to be upholding respect, which is what they need to do. So when you go on to uh, contention or counter contention two, saying that the uh, logo needs to be changed, that it's like the NFL is in charge of changing the name. Once again, we're not talking about the name. We're saying the name is bad. It needs to go away. The logo is what needs to be kept. Um, they basically don't really give us any argumentation except that it's going to make the NFL look good. Um, making the NFL look good really isn't all that great of a thing. But when you go down to the tie back, they don't give you any argumentation how this doesn't flow through respect and how it doesn't generate more respect for the culture. So basically, uh, you're going to be casting a vote for the name of the ballot. But if you want to go into contention one of racism, because that's so great, um, they only give you one example of how the mascots are asking or acting barbaric. When you look to the argumentation saying that the cowboy jumped the Redskins, that just makes the cowboys look that much worse. Not that they really need it because their record does that for them. But <laughs> Resolution completely true, and that is what the naming team has to do. Thank you. Two-minute rebuttal by the Prime Minister, Rachel Carr. They are going to look to two major points of how come you're going to be voting for me and my partner, the affirmative team. The first point is that how we state uh, that it's actually going to cost this team more money to actually continue this tradition and to be racist because as my partner clearly stated that the NFL, that this team and the NFL is going to lose tax exemptions which is going to equate to billions of dollars if they don't, if they don't um, listen to uh, what they're being told. Um, the second point is that the um, Native Americans, we stated in our um, contention that the Native Americans find it offensive. So they're saying that we don't say in our, uh, in our warrants uh, if they actually find the logo offensive also. But I'm going to go back to my warrant number two, where it's clearly stated that uh, the National Congress of American Indian states that the Indian mascots and um, mascots, logos, names perpetuate racism and bigotry. It's clearly stated here in my point. So if you guys got that, they missed it, and it is offensive. We say that two million Native Americans find it offensive. On warrant number three, where we talk about headdresses, we say that they're, they're only um, counter to this is that people aren't wearing the headdresses to be offensive, but we're, but it is offensive to them. So we're, whether they're wearing it to be offensive or not, it still is offensive to these people, and we need to listen to what they're saying and correspond with this, because it's going to um, 
it's going to be better for the NFL as a whole if we can uh, diminish the amount of like racism and bigotry that's happening in this game that everyone across America is watching and supporting. Um, the third point. So we said that you're going to want to lay this ground on respect. So what is more respectful to the Native Americans is if we change the name and the logo, or if, um, as our opponent stated, if we can just all cheer on uh, the Cowboys beating up the Indians on the field. When we're in this ground on respect, you're definitely going to look to me and my partner's point of how come it costs, it's going to be better for the NFL to be less races and how Native Americans find it offensive, which is really the main point that you're looking to when weighing this round because um, it's the most respectful thing you can do to their culture. So I'm going to leave it Also, please give a round of applause to Jamal Neji, who is the speaker of the house. Jamal is another one of those 10 individuals who are considered one of the top debaters in Northern California. As in any parliamentary debate, certainly there have to be judges and you are the judges and so we have to find out how many of you would vote for the affirmative side. And how many of you would vote for the opposition? Seems pretty close, so as I always say, almost every single semester, it sounds like a tie. Hey! Have a good night.